It began as genius and grew to be legend and has become at long last the most advanced production car on the planet. You've never seen anything like this before. Back in 1983, the fourth generation of America's sports car, the Chevrolet Corvette, hit the market as a 1984 model. Built on an all-new platform that GM dubbed as Uniframe, the C4 was the most highly anticipated Corvette to date. But many of the Corvette's longtime fans were not so happy with its space-age design and that it was more racing focused, and also not so happy with its higher price. A Corvette with never before available unidirectional turbine fin wheels and tires individually engineered for all four corners. Although the C4 got some new fans with the return of the convertible in 1986 and the high performance ZR1 in 1990, the biggest fans today are from the baby boomer generation who typically couldn't afford them back when they were new. This is a story of the fourth generation of the Chevrolet Corvette, best known as simply the C4. This is my old car. The most advanced production car on the planet is now called Corvette. Chevrolet is taking charge. So you may be wondering if I may be a member of the baby boomer generation, considering I specifically mentioned that in the opener to this episode. Well, I'm not. But I am close enough that as a teenager in the 1980s, when the C4 Corvette debuted, I wish then that I was a few years older, not to mention many dollars richer, so that I could have my own. I'm gonna get them. They got my van. If I don't get my ride back, I'm gonna be talking to you, man. Although by 1987, I was able to say that I owned a vet. Well, okay, it was a Chevette. Not exactly the same. The C3 generation, which ran from 1968 to 1982, saw an increase in sales each year since 1970. And much of that was thanks to the car's designer, Zora Arcus Duntoff. Despite the fact that he joined General Motors in 1953, the same year that the Corvette first debuted, Arcus Duntoff has often been referred to as the father of the Corvette, as he offered much input into the C2 model, and rose the chief engineer for the Corvette in 1967. Although the look of the C3 was much different from the C2, as was the C2 from the C1, all three had a common car platform for the time, body on frame and rear wheel drive. Arcus Duntoff retired from GM in 1975, and his replacement, Dave McClellan, along with McClellan's lead designer, Jerry Palmer, began a clean sheet design plan for the C4. Prior to the C4, the Corvette was unique from other GM vehicles in that its body panels were fiberglass instead of sheet metal. Fiberglass was lighter weight and more cost effective for lower volume cars, as it didn't require expensive sheet metal stamping dies. Starting in 1973, the fiberglass panels evolved into a material called Sheet Molding Composite, or SMC which along with fiberglass included a plastic resin that could be better molded under heat and high pressure. Over time, GM engineers were able to tweak the SMC formula to produce body panels that were smoother right out of the mold, which in turn resulted in higher quality paint finishes. The C4 Corvette would continue using SMC, but the body panels would be attached to what GM referred to as a uniframe. Uniframe differed from a unibody design in that the SMC body panels did not provide any structural support, as sheet metal would do for a typical unibody car. The only body style initially for the C4 would be a coupe with a removable target top, which required increased bracing along the door sills to compensate for the lack of structure between the windshield and rear window, which in turn made entry and exit a challenge. Speaking of the rear window, the C4 would finally resolve a long-standing pain point that Corvette owners suffered through since the start of the C2 generation, and that was the lack of a traditional trunk opening on hardtop models. The C4 would finally introduce a glass rear window that could be opened from the outside. Although technically the C4 wasn't the first Corvette to offer the rear hatch, as a special collector's edition on the final C3 model in 1982 offered it as well. Before I continue, a big thank you to today's sponsor, Raycon, makers of premium audio products, like their most popular, the Everyday Earbuds. And you can use my link in the description below to buy your set now. Over the past six years, Raycon has made a name for themselves with premium audio products, such as their new Magic 180 charging cable and faucet filter earning tens of thousands of five-star reviews. Act now to take advantage of their early Black Friday sale. Raycon is offering at least 20% off everything on their site, with some products discounted as much as 50%. Raycon recently sent me a pair of their everyday earbuds, and I let my wife give them a try, as she has been dedicated to a certain other brand, and I wanted to make sure if I could win her over. All we had to do was remove them from their case, go to her phone's Bluetooth settings, and look for the everyday earbuds. It was that simple. Not to mention the sound quality is amazing, and they are now her go-to source for music at work. To recharge, just plug in the case using the included USB charging cord. 
Each Raycon set also comes with several earpiece sizes to provide the most comfortable fit. All this for a price that is half of competing brands. You can also get your everyday earbuds in lots of different colors, and they have a 32-hour battery life. Get an early start on holiday sales by shopping Raycon's early Black Friday sale today. Go to buyraycon.com slash myoldcar to get 20 to 50% off site-wide. As 1983 would have been the 30th anniversary of the first Corvette in 1953, the original plan was to have the C4 begin with the 1983 model year. Corvette production had moved to Bowling Green, Kentucky for the 1981 model year, and the challenge is to retool that plant for the C4 as well as quality issues for many supplier parts, kept pushing out the production date. A total of 43 Corvettes were created with VINs, or vehicle identification numbers, that identified them as 1983 models, but they were all pre-production models and never sold to the public. 42 of those models were eventually destroyed, with the final one initially left on display at the assembly plant, and then later it was transferred to the National Corvette Museum, which is across the highway from the Bowling Green assembly plant. The production delays also forced the design team to carry over the same V8 engine that was in the 1982 model, the 350 cubic inch 5.7 liter L83 V8, which could only muster 205 horsepower. The L83 engine only lasted that one model year, being upgraded to L98 in 1985 that made 230 horsepower. Although horsepower in the low 200s may not sound all that great today, it was high enough back then for the Corvette to be banned from the SCCA, or Sports Car Club of America by 1987, as too many of its competitors cried foul due to the Corvette's dominance in racing in the previous three years. If you wanted your 84 Corvette with a manual transmission, you had to wait a year into production for it to be available. This manual transmission was known as a 4 plus 3 and was designed by Doug Nash, a former hot rodder from the 1960s. The 4 plus 3 was a 4-speed manual with an overdrive for the top three gears that could be engaged via a button on top of the shifter, which helped save fuel. The 4 plus 3 manual was the only manual transmission option up to the 1988 model year. The C4 was also the first Corvette to have a clamshell style front hood that extended down to the car's belt line. Pop-up headlamps returned for the C4, although for the first time since 1957, they were single units instead of dual. And just to add to the car's futuristic look, the headlamps didn't just pop up, but instead rotated 180 degrees and could be seen facing the other way on the inside when the hood was up. Unfortunately, the headlamp motors use nylon gears that have a bad tendency to get chewed up over time, enough that they eventually can no longer rotate. Such a design also wouldn't make it to production today for at least two reasons. The first being that pop-ups in any form can no longer pass pedestrian crash tests, but also because the headlamps were contained entirely within the front hood, which would be outlawed today, as both head and tail lamps can no longer be attached to any moving part of the car's body, unless you have another set of lights that don't move as a backup. Inside, the C4 transitioned away from standard analog gauges, and in their place were lots of LED and digital displays. A dazzling array of instruments and operating controls combined to make the machine an extension of the driver. Digital displays were becoming more common across other cars in the 1980s, and for the automotive purists out there, the space-age look inside wasn't their favorite. However, the housing around the gauges was pure 80s, in other words, square. There was even space on the dash devoted to a series of switches that allowed the driver to customize which engine stats would appear between the speedometer and tachometer. Where there should be a glove box was originally intended to be an airbag, but when that wasn't ready in time, they simply left a big unusable space instead. And of course, you could get leather seats, although for an extra cost. Thanks to the early start for the 1984 model year, sales for that year were the second best in Corvette's history, a record that still stands today. At over 51,000 sold, it was only off by less than 2,000 sales from the record-setting 1979 model. Not bad considering its starting price of $21,800 for 1984, which would be over $64,000 in 2023. But by 1985, sales dropped to just under 40,000, even with the improved engine. Sales would drop slightly each year of the C4, and not surprisingly, the price also went up each year. Starting in 1986, ragtop fans rejoiced with the return of the Corvette convertible, the first since 1975. The 86 convertible was also chosen for the Indy 500 pace car that year, so of course replica models were available for sale. Chevrolet worked with American Sunroof Corporation, or ASC, to design the folding top. Not unusual for back then was having the rear glass on the soft top be plastic, which was a necessity to get the folded roof to fit under the hinged tonneau cover. And of course, the process of raising or lowering the top was all manual. The only electrical part involved was the release of the tonneau cover. And although the hardtop model didn't have a huge amount of trunk space, it was better than the convertible, 
as this trunk was essentially just the space available for the folded top. But the engineers with Chevrolet and ASC did a decent job for the time with adding additional bracing under the car, essentially making it feel structurally the same as the hardtop with its target top removed. Even the shock absorbers were calibrated differently for the convertible. Although there was a bump in horsepower on the base engine for 1985, by 1987, if you wanted serious performance and had an extra 27 grand to spend, you could order the B2K Callaway Twin Turbo Package. Although Callaway cars did the design and install, it could be ordered from Chevrolet dealers and maintain the standard GM warranty, along with an additional year or 12,000 miles of warranty from Callaway. The new engine's official horsepower rating was 382, although most believe the true number was far higher than that. And if that still wasn't enough, a single copy of the Callaway Sledgehammer was built for 1988 with just under 900 horsepower and recorded a top speed of just under 255 miles per hour, making it the fastest road car available when it was new. For a few less dollars, you could instead get the 35th anniversary model in 1988 that came with a removable hardtop and unique white interior and were individually numbered, making them one of the more valuable C4s today. The start of the 90s introduced an upgraded dashboard that finally ditched the old square design for a more driver-centric layout and more traditional analog gauges. Another option for performance also arrived in 1990, with the return of the first ZR1 model since 1972. This is the Corvette ZR1. Thanks to GM's acquisition of Lotus in 1986, Lotus designed an upgraded version of the 5.7 liter V8, dubbed the LT5, making 375 horsepower. However, Lotus didn't do the assembly. That was farmed out to, of all companies, Mercury Marine, as in makers of outboard marine engines, due to their expertise in aluminum. The ZR1 also used a new ZF six-speed transmission that first became available in standard Corvettes the year before. Look, this is your last chance. Once I get going, I'm not stopping and letting you out. Now get out! Barney, let's go, hit it! On the outside, you can identify ZR1s from other Corvettes thanks to its wider rear end to accommodate the rear tires that were now 315 millimeters in width. The tail lamps were also revised from the traditional circles to rounded rectangles, and the center-mounted stoplight moved from above the license plate to the top of the rear window. The look of the new tail lamps on the ZR1 was so well received that Chevrolet decided to change them on the base models as well for 1991, which was a very unpopular decision for existing ZR1 owners, who now lost the best telltale sign of their cars were not just ordinary Corvettes, although those with a keen eye could still tell them apart due to the placement of the third brake light. The ZR1 would be the highest priced Corvette up to that point, selling for just under $59,000 in 1990. That's over 138000 in 2023 dollars. Considering that price, it's amazing that nearly 7,000 ZR1s were sold during its six-year production run. Starting in 1991, the C4 saw relatively few changes in its final years, as GM was working behind the scenes to get the C5 model released in time for the Corvette's 40th anniversary in 1993. Although the 5.7 liter was upgraded to the LT1 platform with 300 horsepower for 1992, the C5 was far from ready, thanks to financial troubles and changes in leadership that forced too many delays. So instead, a 40th anniversary edition of the C4 was available for 1993, painted exclusively in ruby red with the same color leather seats. With the revised launch date of the C5 Corvette to begin for the 1997 model year, Chevrolet wanted a special model as a send-off for the C4. That would be the Grand Sport model, only available in 1996, and only available in blue with a wide white stripe down the center. With the ZR1 having ended its run the year before, the Grand Sport wouldn't reach the final ZR1's horsepower of 405, but it did reach 330, making it the highest horsepower rating for a standard production Corvette up to that point, and was only available with a manual transmission. With just 1,000 Grand Sport models ever built, of which only 190 were convertibles, any remaining copies are among the most valuable Corvettes from the C4 generation. Considering there are over 358,000 C4 models built during its 12-year run, there are still plenty available for sale today, with prices ranging from well below 10 grand for early models with pre-LT5 engines to six figures for well-cared-for ZR1s. Over the following two and a half decades, General Motors would offer four more generations of the Corvette, which considering GM's bankruptcy during the middle of the C6 generation, it's a minor miracle that the Corvette has made it to 70 years old in 2023. The current generation, C8, is the first production Corvette to have a mid-engine layout, and is also the first Corvette to offer all-wheel drive, thanks to the option of an electric motor powering the front wheels, called the E-Ray. It makes the technology of the C4 look like horse and buggy in comparison, but for a kid of the 80s like I was, the C4 was all I ever would have wanted.
Thanks for watching. If you like this video, click the like button and subscribe to my channel. I'll, uh, I'll park it myself. If you once owned a car from the 80s to mid 2000s that you rarely see today and would like it featured in a future episode, leave a reply in the comments or contact me at the email shown here. See you next time. Didn't Hannibal say to leave your keys in the ignition? Uh, it's one thing to park out here in Siberia, but to leave the keys? Try not to think about it.